Hello my science lovers! This is the next episode of my Scientist Mel short series where I take one of the topics that I talk about on my Science of Life stream and condense it down into shorter bits for people who love science but are short on time. So today we're going to talk about flat earthers and why do they think the way that they do. Hmm. So let's go ahead and get started. Alrighty, so today we are going to talk about flat earthers. So one thing we need to consider is that the earth is an oblate spheroid. It looks round because it spins. We are too small to see the curvature of the earth, therefore we have to rely on experimentation as well as instruments to show us the shape of the earth. Now this image comes to us from Japan's Himawari 8 satellite 24 hour image that essentially gives us an idea of just the shape of the earth. So we can't rely on sight alone. So flat earthers, what's that about? Is it delusion, conspiracy, mental illness? Is it a cult? Well, the thing is, is it's important we understand the root as to why people think the earth is flat. Do these individuals suffer personality disorders and or mental illness? Is there a cult mentality or a sense of belonging they feel in this? So what we need to do is get to the bottom of the flat earth movement from its early, early, early roots. So in the 1800s, Sam Robotham, aka Parallax, that was the name he went with. It kind of sounds very sci-fi, so it's quite creative, I suppose. Wrote a book called The Zetetic Astronomy. Earth not a globe. So what did that look like? Well here's his publication here. <laughs> He's proving that it's flat in this particular publication and note he goes by the name Parallax. And so the experiment that he did, this was his definitive proof. that. So he had an experiment where he looked through a telescope and he said he saw boats at six miles proving that the earth was flat. Well, there's a particular type of different sorts of issues with this particular experiment that he had. Um, so let's talk about them. <laughs> Robotham held his telescope eight inches above the canal water, allowing refraction to interfere with the measurements showing that it was essentially a flat earth, and it's not. This is why we rely on multiple instruments and data from multiple sources to ensure there is no user error in our experiments. Roe Botham had substantial user error. His flawed experiment led to the modern flat earth movement which sparked the scrutiny of a particular scientist who later regretted his decision of getting involved. So who is this scientist you say that was involved with this particular thing? Alfred Russell Wallace. He is actually a founder of modern biology and like many of us he was gobsmacked, puzzled, confused, and boggled by the flat earth movement. He read this book by Roe Botham aka Parallax and found it to be nonsensical and he decided to take it upon himself to debunk flat earth. Well if you've been on the internet at all you kind of know how that tends to go, especially if you've tried to engage with flat earth people. Well, let's go ahead and tell Alfred's story. In 1870, John Hampton published an ad in a paper essentially giving a 500 gold British pound bounty by flat earthers to debunk Roe Botham's experiment using the same canal. Hampton was a Protestant rector's son who read that book by William Carter called Theoretical Astronomy Explained and Exposed. So he read a book one time and he decided, well, this and this other book by Parallax, this is definitive proof. Well, hmm. Hampton, like Carpenter, wanted to rid the world of the round earth lie and persist that the earth was flat. Wallace thought it would be easy money to debunk this as a simple telescope experiment would show he is correct. It's what we call the Bedford Level Experiment. 
What he failed to realize is that flat earth people are not rational. They ignored his experiment and evidence and insisted they were right. So if you've ever been on the internet, then you're quite familiar with these types of tactics by individuals who indulge in this flat earth type of fantasy. All right, so let's talk about the experiment itself. He needed a telescope, black band on a pole that was the same height as the scope, a red disc that was the same height as the scope, this was disc A, and disc B, which was just about four feet lower than A. So here's a schematic sketch of what he did. So we have the telescope, that's the section on the left of the picture there. The red disc A is the same height as the scope. The red disc B is four feet lower than A. So what's the rationale? If the disc at the same height of the telescope is in line with the black band on that pole, C, then it's a flat Earth. If not, it's round. And his experiment corrected for any refraction. So here's another sketch of the view from the telescope. So you can kind of see with the black band and um, with red disc A and B, A is on top as the same height of the telescope and B is four feet lower. So we can go back and take a look. Here we go. If, it's, if A is the same height as the telescope and the black band flat earth, if not round, well that was the view that he saw looking through the telescope. Here are the sketches that they drew of what they saw looking through the telescope. So they show the inversion of the telescope. Now this is drawn by Hampton's referee, William Carpenter, and Dr. Kulcher, who was Wallace's referee. So they wanted people there to verify that the data was correct. The experiment was successful in showing the Earth's curvature. So what happened after that? <laughs> what do you think happened? Let's Let's mull that over. Okay, well, Hampton would not look into the telescope and said that he trusted Carpenter's view. Yet both views presented the same, exact same data. The data was sent to John Walsh, who was the editor of the Field magazine, who confirmed Wallace as the winner of the bet and published the results. Hampton had to pay the 500 gold British pounds, but sued Wallace for 15 years trying to get the money back and even sent abusive letters as well as death threats. Wallace in turn had libel suits against Hampton as well as court or orders for him to cease and desist. So it got on a legal level of abuse and harassment in regards to Hampton and Wallace. So flat earthers, but why? But why? <laughs> well, let's talk about why they would think this way. There's an inherent importance of being right that our culture kind of encourages. It has a bit of a mandated type of feeling to where if you're right, that's how you're gonna be successful. It also can drive substantial acts of hate. Now our education system is kind of built on if you're right, you get an A, if you're wrong, you get an F. And so there's no incentive for people to, to, to accept the fact that being wrong is how we learn. Being wrong also equals embarrassment. You don't want to be the person that got a wrong answer um, trying to answer a question that your teacher called out. This is a first world race. So we're constantly in competition with each other to try, to try to be more right than the other person. And being wrong is also associated with weakness. So this, this feeling that we get to where we don't want to possibly be wrong because, you know, <laughs> well, where does that come from? It is a need to be right in society and is mandated. It drives acts of hate, including war as well as violence. The educational system is set up to be right or wrong answers. We don't see a lot of praise for asking interesting questions. If you get the wrong answer, it's embarrassing. People have this need to be right because of societal and institutional pressures, including the educational construct. 
Our society is in a race to be right all of the time. We want to be the person in our job who has the right answers. Being wrong is seen as weakness in society. So if you're wrong, you're stupid, weak, and competent. And this is not the, the case. Yet, it is viewed this way. People in science, 90% of the time, are wrong. But it's the wrongness that generates us to know what the rightness is. So back to flat earthers. <laughs> is it delusion? No, it's not a delusion because multiple people believe this. Mental illness? Well, there are some mental illnesses associated with delusion, but this is not the same. It isn't a cult because it's a large group of people, yet it is still kind of strange. Um, this isn't something that we see. So what's it most likely to be? A conspiracy. But the interesting thing is, is Flat Earth follows what we kind of call the system justification. So well, let's take a look at that. System justification, these over here on the side are components of it. We have this political psychology where it's generated a lot by self-interest. There's dominance, resistance, in-group bias, ethnocentrism, homophily, outgroup, and antipathy or antipathy. I say words wrong sometimes, but you know that's how it goes. <laughs> so let's break these down just a little bit. All right, so this group justification, self-evidently true meaning, they are the only people that are going to believe, they are only going to believe what they think they see. So they're self-evidently true. They're not going to believe any evidence outside of their own. This is kind of like confirmation bias, and I talk about this in another episode. They serve their own interests. They're not interested in change at all and they're not interested in anybody else's well-being or interests for that matter actually they develop their own ideologies for this justification they do have a preference for those who are like them so if you're not part of their group they're going to attack you we see this oftentimes with people who think the earth is flat especially if you're on the internet there are preference for those who are like them Hostile prejudicial to those outside of their circle. They seek conflict, not resolution. They are not looking for correct answers, and they're not looking to try to rationalize um, their particular, their view with any kind of evidence that refutes their own. We may see a rise in flat earthers and other conspiracy theorists as societal con uh, constructs become more threatened. So the more we have some kind of societal unrest, especially with the current political climate and societal environment, we might see more conspiracy theorists, including flat earthers, as they look to do what we call social belonging. <laughs> it's powerful. This is an inherent need. Flat earthers belong to a super special secret group that has all of the right answers that unlock the secrets of the universe. It is a strong need that is filled easily in this construct of thought. It's way common in society. We have to have this feeling of belonging to a particular group and it's powerful and it's strong. Now, why would we see more of these conspiracy theorists pop up, especially in the current um, political environment as well as the societal um, issues that we're dealing with currently. Well, the reason is we have two different mental systems. We have suspicious and reflective. Suspicious is automatic, as in danger, real Will Robinson, danger is real. That's associated with primal fear, and that can be very easily activated with unrest and instability in society as well as politics. Reflective is the rational and reasoning system of our brain. It's the one that was like, calm down now. It's going to be okay. It ain't so bad. Sometimes people feed into that suspicious side, and if it's constantly on fire, that's where you deal with this irrational behavior. So let's talk a bit 
further about what, you know, examples, essentially examples of these types of um, mental systems. So if you are in the woods and you hear a twig break, you think, will this hurt me? Your reflective brain usually kicks in and allows you to rationalize that the situation is dangerous. Is the twig snap like a squirrel sound or is it a bear sound? If it's a squirrel, hey, this isn't going to kill me. It's all right. If it's a bear, then you got to worry. It becomes problematic if suspicious is overactive and reflective does not keep up. Too much suspicious brain activity leads to irrationality. And that irrationality is kind of what we see in conspiracy theorists. So this flat earth stuff, <laughs> they are irrational and you can't reason with them. They won't listen or accept evidence and they may be incapable of accepting evidence. If that suspicious side of their brain is constantly far firing off, the rational side is not going to kick in, especially if this is allowed to go unchecked for so long. Kind of use a little bit of example of the Hulk. You know, there's one Hulk movie where, where he shows up. He's been in Hulk mode for like a couple years. Bruce Banner's been quiet the entire time and Hulk just is like, ah, you know, it's kind of similar. So individuals that have that suspicious side firing off all the time, they're constantly suspicious. And where they find comfort is in that need to be right and being part of some kind of social belonging. So what do we do when we're interacting with individuals who are flat earthers? Well, it's best not to engage in arguments on the internet. Some people do. But if you're wanting to do that, you need to be cautious as to not give them a voice. They're not going to believe anything you say. And what you can do is promote correct information. So if you highlight a particular comment, say this is why this information is incorrect, A, B, C, and D. Use that as a teachable moment to kind of debunk other things. Be certain you check your sources and be positive. I make it a point not to really debate flat earthers on the internet. Instead, I send them links to find appropriate psychologists to help them find the help that they need in order to be healthy. So, my sources for this particular talk. <laughs> I don't expect you guys to read all of this. So, but really quickly, if you're curious about this, you can go on my website, scientistmail.com, click on any of these links, and um, you'll, you'll be able to download my slides. Then you'll be able to click on any of those links, and you can dive in a bit further where I got my information. If you have questions, ask me in my comments on YouTube here. You can hit me up on Twitter. Um, but the thing is, is I think it's important we understand flat earthers in regards to why they think the way that they do. And that's what I hope to have achieved with this particular video. So I'm going to take a moment to thank my patrons. Um, they make what I do possible. And my pledges start at just a dollar a month. So you can hit me up on patreon.com slash scientist Mel. They get access to exclusive content. I'm going to start doing a show just for them. They also get early access to my audio podcast, hashtag Hey Scientist Mel. And because of them, I have new lighting. I have a new camera. I have a green screen kit that I'm going to play with really soon. I've got it here and I'm excited. Um, they help me keep the lights on and help me run and do what I got to do. And if you can't make a monthly commitment, that's okay. PayPal.me slash Scientist Mel is an option as well. You can find me anywhere on the internet. ScientistMel.com, Periscope. Um, I don't have the WordPress anymore. It hasn't been updated. That's been integrated into ScientistMel.com. You can find me on YouTube or Facebook. Send me your questions and let's learn together. So that has been Flat Earthers, the science of version, but shorts. I hope you have enjoyed this particular talk, and I am super glad you're here to learn these things with me. So, have a fantastic day, and I'm sending you squishy science hugs. <laughs>